2022 is finally over, and so it's time to look at the best and worst games of this year. And to the surprise of absolutely no one, it's been yet another mediocre year in video games. Yes, I'm sure you're all thinking of one game in particular that we all enjoyed, but listen, I grew up in a time where there were several great games that released every year, and this year I really struggled. I had to play a lot of games to actually come up with five real recommendations for you. As for the five worst games, this might have been my easiest list to make yet. But before I go off on a tangent, in the beginning of the video, let's go over the rules really quick. It's the same exact rules as last year with a slight tweak. First of all, the game has to have released in 2022. Seems pretty obvious, but as an addendum to that, no early access games. But if an early access game released fully this year, it does count as a current year release. Second rule, no remasters or faithful graphical remakes. Reimaginings are allowed, which to briefly explain what a reimagining is, it's basically an old game remade in a new gameplay style. Like the new versions of Resident Evil 2 and 3 and Final Fantasy 7. And the final rule, I must have played it. And so if you're familiar with this channel, it should come as no shock that I am starting with the five worst games. Let's be honest, that's why most of you are here. And just like last year, I want to emphasize that I don't go out of my way to play bad games most of the time. Otherwise, this list would be dominated by indie games that no one's ever heard of. And in my opinion, that's just incredibly boring and pointless. I would rather shit on the AAA industry as I have for basically the entire history of my channel. So don't think of this list as the five objectively worst games that release this year. Of course it's not. It's more like a list of the most disappointing games or the most bland, repetitive, lazy sequels. And of course, the games with the most political propaganda. So if you don't like it, fuck off. Without further ado, here's the best and worst games of 2022. It's just like a stupid summer fling. What else did I think was going to happen? Uh, let's see. Uh, love stability. That kind of in the ballpark? Oh, shit, I'm sorry. That was Ryan and me. Uh, let me see. Ah, here it is. Yours just says Roadhead. Oh, actually, that's just a generic all-men list. Huh. Seems legit. We're killing her first. And we're starting this list off strong with a game I'm sure most of you forgot even exists. The Quarry. It's essentially Until Dawn, but bad. Despite the fact that Until Dawn had a very generic story and was pretty formulaic, it was obviously self-aware to a point. It seems like every game afterward that these devs have made is completely lacking that charm, and The Quarry is no exception. And so, of course, just like last time, you take control of a series of young adults who are camp counselors, and so right after the summer has ended and they're about to head home, of course, they get trapped here and have to survive a single night. And the monster of the week this time is a bunch of hillbilly werewolves. You've already played this before, and the worst part is it's worse in every single way to Until Dawn. Unlike the Dark Pictures Anthology games, which were on the shorter side, this one is about the same length as Until Dawn and feels a bit higher budget than those anthology games. But none of the budget was spent on writers, clearly, because almost every fucking character is unlikable, to the point where my chat latched onto Jacob, or as my chat likes to call him, Kyle. I'm sure the resemblance is purely a coincidence, especially since this game desperately wants you to hate this guy. And because the first act is so boring, we decided to do a fuckface run, essentially trying to kill every character except Jacob by doing literally nothing when the quick time events pop up. And guess what? Not only does Jacob have the most opportunities to die, but despite quite literally putting the controller down during the quick time events, a lot of the characters still don't die. You have to make very specific decisions 
for all the characters to be able to die instead of just being turned into a werewolf. And the pacing in this game is just fucking awful. It's literally like two hours in before any of the characters even can die. Also, it's yet another female empowerment story where pretty much every badass character is female. All the men are pathetic cucks. Even when it makes literally no sense, Jacob's supposed to be the jock, yet he's a coward and he's incompetent and he doesn't know how to use a gun. This shit is a fucking joke. We're supposed to believe that fucking Sweet Life, yes, that's what I'm gonna call her, is the gun expert of the group and a badass and blah blah blah. You know, you've seen this shit, it's just modern writing. The game was obnoxious, it was boring, nothing about it was interesting inherently. I actually had to re-watch my own recordings just to make this segment of the video, because I just forgot basically everything. It's forgettable, it's bland, it sucks. Don't waste your time with this shit. That boy of ours is everything I expected. So clever, kind, be sure he's yours. To quote myself, the worst thing a video game can be is boring, and God of War Ragnarok is one of the most boring fucking games I've ever played. Now, of course, a game being boring is subjective, but can you honestly tell me that you wanted to see 10 hours worth of cutscenes? or brain-dead puzzles that involve just throwing your axe or blades at an object in the room, and all of the story mandatory puzzles are spoon-fed to you step by step of the way, so you literally can't fuck it up? Or what about all the countless different forms of hidden loading screens that we've seen a million times? This game does not respect your time. There's no reason it had to be 25 hours given the amount of content that's in it. And then you have the story itself, the thing that everyone praises about this game. I can't even believe people are putting this as their second favorite game of 2022. Gaming truly is fucking dead at this point. I legitimately don't understand why people think this is a great story. There was nothing about it that stood out. Honestly, it could have been a Marvel movie plot. In fact, the humor feels straight ripped out of any MCU film. The safe, bland, quirky, Redditor-tier shit that is inoffensive. And the plot itself felt like something Ryan Johnson would have wrote, except without even any of the meaningful subversion that was the reason why people hated The Last Jedi, because honestly, the twists in this don't even fucking matter. Does it matter if Fenrir dies in the beginning to emotionally manipulate you if he just comes back? Does it matter that Kratos and Atreus aren't following the original prophecy if it turns out in the end of the story they were following a second prophecy after all? And most of the events from the original prophecy still fucking happen. None of the important characters die. Let's be honest, no one gave a fuck about Brock. Did anyone really feel anything from that scene? We were told at the end of God of War 2018 that Kratos was gonna die. And honestly, I don't care that they didn't kill him, but I do care that they didn't kill someone else important instead. Freya, the blatant Mary Sue, absolutely should have died, but obviously she's a writer favorite character. Bow to your queen! So instead, how about you kill Atreus, who nobody actually likes, let's be honest, in fact, you're forced to play as him several times over the course of the story, and his gameplay fucking sucks. And we could talk about gameplay too, the one element of this game that's actually good, and guess what? Almost nobody who even likes this game praises the gameplay, which confirms my fucking theory at the end of the original video and many other videos I've made in the past, where games are not being made for gamers anymore. They're made for you normie casual fucks who have shit taste. The only good element of it was the combat. And you're not even in combat the vast majority of the time. I wanted more combat because it was actually fun. If you actually liked games, you would want more combat because that's what games fucking are, the gameplay. They're an interactive experience. And yet, this is what you want. You want giant fucking movies instead. And then we have the woke factor. You want to tell me that it's not woke to put three black characters in Norse mythology, again, from the whitest place on the planet. If this was any other medium, you would have called it out as woke immediately. There's even a gay side quest in this game. I overlooked it because I never played it. 
But yes, there's a side quest in God of War Ragnarok devoted to a real-life gay couple on the development team. You want to tell me it's not woke? You want to look at the people who made the fucking game, which we got to see at the Game Awards, and you want to tell me it's not fucking woke? Assuming you're all not lying, all this means to me is that the Overton window has shifted so far to the left that the only way a video game is going to be considered woke these days is if a trans black woman is f***ing a man in the ass on screen. The only reason this isn't higher on the list is because at the end of the day, it's not in reality a bad game, but it is incredibly boring and insufferably woke. Your sacred cave. There's something inside I need. And if I can get it, it so will help. and the Nora have spread word of your story. Look at this and dude. What you want? <laughs> Wait till you see the. You know of no spirit. <laughs> Oh yeah, two Sony exclusives made their way onto the worst games of the year list. Yet another quickly forgotten game, Horizon Forbidden West. In theory, it should be a good game because it does improve on quite a few elements of the previous one. And I thought Horizon Zero Dawn was an okay game. Yeah, I had quite a few issues with it. Those issues being even worse in this game. We'll get to that in a second. But the actual monster hunting aspect, those mechanics have been expanded on. There's new weapons, some of the weapons have more moves than last time. You have several different super buffs that you can swap between. The combat definitely has a little bit more depth to it. Now compared to Monster Hunter, which it's obviously inspired by, it's still incredibly shallow. It's another generic Sony cinematic action game with that same close third person camera. And you could even argue it's third person shooting, even though it's done with a bow and harpoons and sticky bombs. It's still shooting. And yeah, look, I know a lot of people don't really like Monster Hunter because all there is to the game is the hunting, but between all the different weapon types, there's a lot of complexity there. You can spend a hundred hours on one weapon and not have mastered it. In this, you just kind of shoot sticky bombs, trip wires, arrows at specific weak points, and that's about as complex as it gets. Yes, each different giant robot has a lot of specific quirks, some have unique debuffs, some of them have elemental weaknesses that completely trivialize the fight, which actually I don't think is a bad thing. And of course, the giant dinosaur ones can be a challenge, especially if you're under-leveled or under-equipped. But honestly, even with all this, I just don't think the combat is very engaging. It still feels a little bit too repetitive, too shallow. The enemies have too much health unless you have overpowered gear from later in the game, and I only played it about 20 hours before I got bored. And apparently the game is over 40 hours long for some reason, so there's no way I'm going back to finish it. And of course, the open world itself is another generic Ubisoft style one with repetitive activities, climbing towers in the form of the Brontosaurus robots. It's all the same shit from the last game. They honestly did not improve the open world in any way. And that's about the best I can say about this game. Everything else was fucking horrible. Whether it's the writing, the character design, which the character design specifically is without a doubt the worst fucking element. This game is the ugliest game I've ever seen. I have never seen such a juxtaposition between the beauty of the open world itself which obviously all of the various art designers put a lot of effort into, but then the human models are some of the ugliest I've ever seen. It's literal dysgenics, because the humans of the past gave their ugly ass disgusting DNA to this AI that then made clones of them once Earth was inhabitable again, right? So honestly, this isn't even a complaint about the game being diverse, though it is kind of comically diverse but more just the actual human models are hard to look at, including Aloy herself, which they purposely made more ugly, even resembling Nikocado Avocado and adding peach fuzz on her face, because that's what we should do with more power on our consoles, right? Not to make the games better in any noticeable or significant way. No, to add peach fuzz on the main character's fucking face. What the hell happened to Guerrilla Games, man? I mean, sure, I'm not gonna pretend I was a huge Killzone fan, I'm really not. But anything would be better than this actual goy slop, dude. 
So you could say it's pretty petty to put this game this high on the list given that it's probably okay at worst. But this game actually disgusted me at multiple points. And again, for once, it had nothing to do with politics, though I would argue that making art purposely ugly is absolutely a political statement. But even if it isn't by your subjective definition, it honestly offended me. It really did. I hope this franchise fucking dies. It's bland, it's generic, it really has nothing going for it. The best thing I can say about it is that the combat is okay, and Aloy is not insufferable as a female protagonist, unlike many other modern games. But that's about where my praise ends. It's a hundred million dollar garbage. Well shit, it's literally pitch black. I can't see. Good thing I don't need to see, because you just hold left, hold right, hold left, hold right, hold left, or hold right, hold left, Hold right, hold left, fuck this shitty ass combat, oh my god. Number two shouldn't come as a shock to anyone, as this wound is still fresh. The Callisto Protocol is absolutely a disappointment in every sense of the word. Despite my expectations for modern games lowering more and more in recent years, somehow this game failed to meet pretty much any of them. The combat sucks, it's not scary, there's barely any story to speak of, the level design is bland, pretty much the only thing going for it is its visual style, and even that feels half-baked as the enemies look so generic compared to Dead Space. Honestly, I could focus this entire section on just the combat and you would understand why it's this high on the list, because it's mobile game tier basic shit. You dodge left, then you dodge right, then you dodge left again, and there's no timing factor to it. You just hold a direction when the enemies attack. And then after you've dodged their combo, you just swing your baton a few times, maybe shoot them once or twice, and then you repeat it again. Except when you realize that Kinesis is incredibly overpowered and allows you to instantly kill enemies with very little effort. And there's only like four fucking enemy types for the majority of the game. As for the horror, there's just no subtlety to it whatsoever. And again, just like I said in the review, Dead Space obviously is not very subtle either. But at least some of the encounters had some tension to them. The enemies looked scary. This game is constantly breaking my immersion with the goofy dodge and the random meat grinders everywhere. And the jump scares, there's so many fucking shitty jump scares in this game. They literally have a jump scare enemy. This game truly belongs on the worst games list. Because it legitimately is not good in any way. It feels like this game should have been a walking simulator or something. The combat just feels like such an afterthought. And when you do so much combat, that is seriously a problem. With God of War Ragnarok and Horizon, I could ignore some of the game's bigger flaws because the combat was fine, at least. Even though this game doesn't feel like it has any political propaganda, other than the typical female character is a badass type of thing, which barely even registers on the woke radar at this point, none of that even matters because the game isn't fun to play. At times, it's even boring. They made a horror game Boring! How the fuck do you manage that? Not to mention the game isn't even finished. It doesn't have New Game Plus. That's a free update in February. So yeah, stay far the fuck away from this one. Do not purchase it even on a sale. It absolutely sucks. Now before I get to the worst game of the year, let's talk about a few dishonorable mentions, as I played a lot of mediocre games this year, so here's three more games you absolutely should avoid. The first game is Postal 4, which I very nearly put as number 5 on this list, as this game feels like a neutered Reddit humor version of Postal 2, it's lacking all of the charm and edgy humor, somehow the gunplay feels even worse than a game that came out 20 years ago, figure that shit out, and the level design is beyond awful. The fucking sewer level, which is one of the first missions by the way, is one of the most boring missions I think I've ever played in any FPS. 
Not to mention the game was fully released from early access before it was actually finished. It was still a buggy, unoptimized piece of shit, and it was missing all sorts of features that were in Postal 2. Now I've heard they patched in most of that content and the game runs okay now, but honestly it doesn't really matter. This game will not stand the test of time. It will be forever known as the inferior Postal 2. The second dishonorable mention is for the Resident Evil Village DLC. You get to play as Rosemary Winters in the future and she's a teenage girl and she needs to dive inside Kingdom Hearts or some shit. It was fucking stupid. This did not fit Resident Evil in any way. And it's basically one giant asset flip. It's all the same areas from Village. Not to mention it's completely pointless anyway. It just ends with you defeating Mother Miranda again and Rosemary gets to see her father one last time. This was just a cash grab from Capcom, a way to neatly wrap up any loose ends from the Ethan Winters saga. It was absolutely a waste of my time and money. And the final dishonorable mention is Stray. Why? Because I fucking hate cats, and I hate walking simulators. I don't need another reason, that's good enough. If you want a $300 waffle maker, you can buy it with the exposure the idols pay you in. Don't expect us to chip in. I've told you before, the idols are trying to build a post-capitalist society where money is not a concept. Yeah? Then why don't you go run off and join uh. the I'm into showering. Are you going to help me get the waffle maker or not? As an investor, I don't like wasting money. You're wearing a fucking bow tie. <sighs> okay, I will throw in 20 bucks for a waffle maker. Nina? Um, good for 10? Who helped you move your forged paintings last month? Fine, 15. What sort of waffle maker can I get for 35 bucks? Uh, presumably one that makes fucking waffles? Hey! <laughs> hey, the wage slave is back! How was your first day? Were the other mercenaries nice to you? You fucks. And to the shock of absolutely nobody, number one is Saints Row, or Saints Woke, as everyone has come to call it. This game is bad in pretty much every single way a video game can be bad. I don't even know where to begin with this. The gameplay is bad, the sandbox is bad, the story is bad, the characters are bad. It's all bad, dude. <laughs> and the worst part is, it isn't a case of, oh, it's so bad it's good. No, it's boring as shit. It's not even as woke as people have led you to believe. It's actually woke in the bland Reddit sense of the word where you have this highly diverse cast of characters and quirky gender-neutral dialogue and basically there's just no distinction between the genders or race or any of that shit. It basically just doesn't call attention to any differences between people. We're all one bland, homogenized human race. And I know that sounds very vague, but let's just say if you're expecting there to be communist propaganda in this, or weird racial supremacy stuff, or gender supremacy stuff. No, as far as I know, they don't touch that shit with a 10-foot pole. It's just kind of this quirky, bland Reddit humor shit that I keep talking about over and over again. And this might actually be the least funny game ever written. And it kind of goes without saying, but this might actually be the worst reboot of all time as well. How do you go from a group of gangsters slowly taking over a city, dealing with other rival gangs, getting in shootouts, and still having an edgy sense of humor to things, to now a bunch of broke college students who get into crime to pay off their fucking student loans? And even the crimes themselves that you commit, the criminal ventures you get into, don't make any fucking sense. Like stealing toxic waste barrels from another company to dispose of them humanely. Who is paying you? How are you making money off of that? It doesn't make any fucking sense. And as you would probably expect, the gameplay is another generic, horrible third-person shooter where enemies have inflated health bars, requiring multiple headshots even on normal difficulty. You now have a skill tree system instead of actually being able to throw a fucking grenade. Even having a sniper rifle is a super ability. And the sandbox is beyond horrible with a bunch of repetitive Ubisoft style activities. Actually probably worse than any Ubisoft game that's at least released in the past 10 years. This game is truly bland and awful in every conceivable way. I wish it was more woke 
because then it would be kind of funny in an ironic way. Because just imagine if, instead of this bland group of generic hipster stereotypes, you had a blatant communist Antifa member, or a white female far leftist who cancels people on Twitter, an incredibly masculine, tall, muscular, trans woman. You know, you get the idea. Super edgy far left shit that is actually written seriously. That would be awesome. I would love that, honestly. Instead, these fucking cowards write the most bland, generic, diverse group of people ever, when Saints Row 2 probably has the most diverse cast of almost any game, and nobody had a problem with it because the characters were great. This game fucking sucks. It truly deserves worst game of the year. We all knew it. As soon as we saw the first trailer that this would be a fucking disaster, this game was so bad and sold so poorly that Volition has now been shut down and merged with Gearbox, and now has set a new low for the AAA industry and reboots, and pretty much any reasonable standards for video games. Now people can point at this game and say, well at least it's not as bad as Saints Row. Now that I've talked about several terrible games, it's time to talk about at least a few decent ones. Like I said at the beginning of the video, it was very difficult to find five real recommendations from this year, but I finally managed to do it after playing 25 new games over the course of 2022. Listen, I'm just as shocked as you are. I never thought I would put a fucking Pokemon game, a modern Pokemon game, on my best games of 2022. Especially since the Pokemon company has now given in to ESG, and if you've played this game, the influence is incredibly obvious. This is easily the most ugly character designs in Pokemon history. And not just ugly, but cartoonishly diverse, including not just several different skin tone options for every single generic NPC type, but having a fucking female bodybuilder as one of the normal NPCs that you see dozens of over the course of the game. Literally having shoulders twice as wide as her hips. And then you have Grusha, the ice gym leader, who is a man despite clearly being drawn like a woman. Rika, who is a woman drawn as a man and called non-binary by the community. The ghost gym leader is an elderly black woman who fucking spits raps, dude. If this was any other time in history, that would be called blatantly racist. And then, of course, you know about the game's various bugs and performance issues. Now, I mostly played in offline mode, so I didn't have nearly as many bugs, but it did run like shit half the time. So how the hell did this make it on the best games list? Well, mostly because I have one important principle, one qualifying factor as to what makes a good game. Is it fun? Yes. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were absolutely fun for me. The most fun I've had in a Pokemon game in over 10 years. This is one of the very few times we're moving to an open world formula was an absolute improvement. No more fucking random battles. No more tight hallways and excessive tutorials and cutscenes. No, you can just wander the world, go wherever you want on the map, and yes, of course, the regions have huge level jumps. You're kind of supposed to do it in a certain order, and it's extremely easy to end up over-leveled for certain gyms. I sweeped most of the gyms because of this and the fact that Pokemon games are just easy as fuck anyway. As long as you've memorized the weaknesses and resistances, you'll have very little issue until near the end of the game where there's a massive level spike at the end of each of the three respective quests. But speaking of those quests, I love this idea that you have three main objectives instead of just, you know, getting the eight gym badges, defeating the evil team, beat the Elite Four, then you're done. You can do all these things in any order you want, you have these giant Pokemon as boss battles, which was a really cool idea. Instead of HMs, your legendary just learns various moves to traverse the landscape. All of that is really fun. And I finally come around on the Dexit situation. I honestly just don't care that they don't have all 1,000 plus Pokemon in the game. 400 was more than enough, and there were a lot of good selections here. 
And the idea of these prehistoric Pokemon and future robot Pokemon was really cool as well. Even the story, at least the very end of the story, is the most interesting ever in any mainline Pokemon game. Now, I still prefer Colosseum and XD, but apparently nobody remembers or cares about those games except for the super fans, so whatever. The point is I actually had fun all the way through, and that is one of the defining features of this best of the year list, is all these games compelled me to finish them. The other 20 games I played, I either forced my way through or just gave up 5 to 10 hours in. But Pokemon held my attention for 40 hours. And that's enough to make it onto the best list. Number four is Teardown, a destruction-based indie game where you pull off a series of heists after a long prep time of destroying various buildings across the map to make the perfect route to steal all the shit and get out in 60 seconds. For those of you who have played this game or at least know about it, you're probably thinking to yourself, wait, didn't this come out last year or the year before? Well, it was in early access for 18 months and officially released this year which is exactly why I added that addendum at the beginning of the video. So I'm counting this as a current year release because I never played the early access generally as a principle. I don't play early access games. Why would you ruin the experience for yourself by playing a shittier version of the game? So now that the thing is fully released, I can safely say it's a good game. It has a very simple concept that it pretty much stretches to its limits. And honestly, the whole prepping for a heist thing does kind of get old eventually as it gets more and more complex and more difficult. I honestly might have preferred the game if it was just destroying stuff and the heists were a gimmick for a select few missions. But I think there was a really solid formula here. You can spend as much time as you like crafting that perfect route through the level and placing your various vehicles so that you can drive across the map to collect all the various shit in time, and you can actually think outside the box for several of the missions, as the objects have an alarm attached to them, but sometimes you can attach the alarm and the object to a vehicle and just drive it to the exit. When you figure out shit like that, it's really satisfying. And over the course of the game, you get more and more tools to destroy the map or create new paths. As far as indie games go, this is definitely one of the better executions of a very simple concept. I certainly wouldn't say it's for everyone, but if this looks interesting to you, I would highly suggest trying it out. Now for number three, we have Hell Pie, a 3D platformer. And if you know me, if a good 3D platformer comes out, it's gonna be on the best list. If you played Hat in Time, this is actually quite a bit similar. A bit of a step down, maybe, but it's the same type of deal, where instead of hats giving you various abilities, you instead have different horns. And I would actually say this is the one element of this game better executed than Hat in Time. Because in Hat in Time, you generally just used the run fast hat or you converted it to the scooter with a badge. And then the other ones were just situational. Hell Pie has a similar problem where there is a running horn. But at least the more situational abilities only had to be used a select few times per level. And the wings that you get at the end are actually just as useful as running. And as for the core platforming, this is simultaneously the best and worst part of the game. As the gimmick of the game is, you have a little cherub attached to you that you can swing around and hit people like, like the PS2 middleware game Whiplash, for the few of you who remember that. But you can also use it to swing in the air. 
And so this makes this game incredibly easy, but it also gives it a unique flair, as there's a skill tree, and after maxing it out, it allows you to swing three times in the air in a row, gaining more and more distance and upward mobility, an air dash in case you fuck up, and if you stay long enough in the air, you will regenerate a fourth swing. And the very last horns you get are a pair of wings that allow you to glide like Spyro. So this is a bit of a double-edged sword for obvious reasons. I actually think the game itself controls great, and exploring the levels is fun, as it usually is for 3D platformers, but there really is no sense of challenge here. If you prefer the type of Crash Bandicoot platformer, this is absolutely not for you, but if you like exploring levels and collecting stuff, I'd say it's mostly good. The only problem is there's no real convenient way to find every collectible. You're probably gonna have to use a guide to reach 100%. That said, the four different worlds are mostly good. I'd say the second world in particular had a nice visual flair to it. It's like some kind of giant skyscraper combined with a bunch of restaurants. And this being a hell-based game, of course the food that these demons are eating is humans. And to briefly touch on the humor, as there is a bit of an edgy humor style to it, it's obviously inspired by Conker's Bad Fur Day, but unfortunately, the humor's just not that good. That said, the game is fun, I can easily ignore the humor and the hell aesthetic being underwhelming, because it's just kind of fun to play. I love 3D platformers, I'll take even the mediocre ones, and this one's pretty good, so I'd recommend it. And number two is a game I literally just finished playing a few days ago, Signalis. Now this is a great example of what all indie games should aspire to be. You take your limited resources or skill set and make something to the best of your ability given those limitations, which is exactly how games in the PS1 era and earlier were made. And obviously Signalis took heavy inspiration from Resident Evil and Silent Hill, especially Silent Hill, given that it is a psychological horror game, emphasis on psychological. And as a massive fan of Resident Evil and definitely also a fan of Silent Hill specifically too, I really enjoyed a lot of elements of this. It has such a great visual style to it that gives it a unique flavor. That sort of like retro future alien vibe, again combined with the Silent Hill Otherworld stuff, and anime androids if you're into that sort of thing. And of course the German everywhere, which I'm actually really glad they didn't translate because it really helps add to that weird horror vibe where you don't quite understand what's going on. As for the gameplay, like I said, it's very inspired by Resident Evil. The gameplay is very similar with some slight stealth mechanics. And so if you like Resident Evil 1, 2, or 3, you'll probably like this. I also want to take a second to praise the puzzles, because this is something I actually complained about Tormented Souls for. I felt like that game, there were too many puzzles, not enough actual horror and combat segments, at least in the amount of it I played before quitting. But this game has the perfect balance, and the puzzles are really creative, not too complicated or obscure. Some of them might actually be a little bit too simplistic, where the notes actually tell you exactly what to do to solve it, but that is definitely better than getting stuck because of some bullshit that is not adequately explained. And it's not like the game solves the puzzles for you, unlike a certain other game in this video. And there's all sorts of really cool moments Without going into too much spoilers, there's like these first person point and click adventure segments. You have to mess around with the radio at several different points, not just for puzzles, but also to deal with a certain really spooky type of enemy. And I think it's a really great game and you should definitely check it out for yourself. That said, there are a few reasons why this didn't make number one. 
I'm gonna try to avoid spoilers here, but the nature of the story, the big twist, which by the way is too heavily foreshadowed, I guessed it in probably the first hour because the game kind of tells you, but it's one of those twists that recontextualizes the whole story, and I really don't like this type of twist. Honestly, if you're thinking of writing this type of story, just stop, go back to the drawing board. I think inherently, any twist that may possibly remove meaning from the adventure itself, or at least remove from its significance, is not a story you should tell. I know that's probably going to be a bit of a hot take, but I've seen this twist too many times, and no matter how well it is written, I've not liked it every single time. They lean too heavily into the psychological part of psychological horror. Not to mention, at the end of the day, this story is about space lesbians. Yeah, that's a little bit of a spoiler, but I just don't like that shit. It doesn't matter if it's anime or not. I am not a fucking weeb. Making something anime does not make it suddenly okay by me. And one of the two main developers' names is literally Yuri. Coincidence? I think not! Jokes aside, I think this is an extremely well-made game, all things considered, and just because I have these minor problems with the story, doesn't really matter at the end of the day. This is obviously a labor of love, and I enjoyed about 90% of the time I played this, with that other 10% consisting of trudging back to the fucking item room over and over again because six inventory slots is not enough for this game. That's my only gameplay complaint. The rest of it was fucking awesome, but that twist was enough for me to knock this down to number two. Before we get to the best game of the year, I figured I played so many games this year, I might as well throw out a few more recommendations. The first being Elix 2, a western RPG developed by Piranha Bytes, the guys who made the Gothic games and the Risen games. And much like their previous work, this game is buggy and janky as fuck. That said, I did have a lot of fun. I kind of like the mix of sci-fi and fantasy. I really enjoyed the jetpack. I feel like any game with a halfway decent jetpack is fun. And I also really enjoyed that pure RPG factor of going from zero to hero. You are incredibly weak at the start of the game, but by the end, you're a badass, shotgunning giant monsters. And that's just inherently fun. It's just a matter of getting past all of the shittiness, the poor writing, the jank, all that, and then you'll have a pretty good time. Then we've got Spark the Electric Jester 3, which actually beat out Sonic Frontiers for honorable mentions. I've said this before, but I really don't like the boost saga of Sonic games, and Frontiers honestly had a lot more problems than that. The open world was fucking so unbelievably repetitive, dude. That game did not need to be 20 hours long, especially when you're just going around loops over and over again. So instead I gave it to Spark 3, just because it's much more similar to Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 in terms of gameplay, but trimming all the fat of the other characters. So it's just speed stage after speed stage with controls that are actually momentum based, although you do have a couple boost mechanics, they're not nearly as overpowered and mindless as Sonic Unleashed Onward. And the game just feels really fun to play. Honestly, the only reason that it didn't beat Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is just because I wanted all five of my recommendations to be in a different game genre. And just because of my personal bias toward collectathons, I chose Hell Pie over this, but this is also a good game, definitely worth your time. And the final one is Final Fantasy Origins, the meme game that everyone hyped up for having an edgy white male protagonist, and as much as I wanted this game to be good, it just really wasn't that good. The combat system was awesome, actually. Had a really high skill ceiling, a lot of different abilities and classes and stuff that you could swap between. A lot of people compared it to Neo 2, which I never ended up playing, I only played the first. But if you like Neo 2, apparently you'd like this. The only reason it didn't make the list is because basically everything that wasn't the combat sucked. The level design was literally fucking hallways. Most of the story cutscenes aren't nearly as funny as that first trailer that everyone fell in love with. And at the end of the day, you're basically just doing the same thing over and over again, but not with nearly the level of quality of the Souls games. 
so it might still be worth a look if the only thing you care about in video games is combat mechanics, but if you care about anything else, maybe just skip this one. This is it. Yes! Yes! Eat shit! Eat shit! And once again, to absolutely no one's surprise, Elden Ring is Game of the Year. And look, this is another one of those times where people probably think I hate this game because people don't know how to handle criticism for games that they fanboy over. But yes, I absolutely enjoyed my time with Elden Ring. It's just not my favorite Souls game. It's not my second favorite Souls game. Honestly, it's not even my third favorite Souls game, I hate to say it. I just don't like the direction that From Software went with this game, and not just because it's an open world. But I'm not gonna waste my time retrudging all of the various complaints I had about the game. Go watch the hour and 39 minute video if you wanna hear those. But essentially the reason why this is game of the year is because I love all of the things that make Souls games good, that being the massive enemy variety, the simple controls that pretty much anyone could pick up and play and understand, the level design featuring all of Miyazaki's various traps and gank squad encounters, and honestly I even kind of like poison swamps even though they're overdone at this point. I love having so many mini-boss style enemies that you only fight like one time, though Elden Ring you fight everything multiple times unfortunately, so that does take away from it a little bit. I love how complex the boss fights can be. The problem is, the reason why I don't like Elden Ring as much is because all of those things are stretched to their limit. And notice how I didn't say difficulty is one of my favorite things about the Souls games. Even though, back when I first played Dark Souls 1, back when it released over 10 years ago, I did enjoy playing a game that was actually difficult because it came out in an era where every game was brain dead easy. And even to this day, probably most AAA releases are brain dead easy if you're playing them on normal difficulty. And now most games have multiple fucking easy modes. As if easy wasn't easy enough, there's now like brain dead cripple mode or game journal mode, right? So I love that the Souls games don't have difficulty settings, so they can properly balance their game's difficulty. Unfortunately, Elden Ring kind of fucks that up. Everyone has talked about this in length, but they made this game harder than Dark Souls 3 in all of the worst ways possible. The bosses have longer and longer attack strings, you don't have any more efficient ways of dodging except jumping, which admittedly, the jump is great, that's the only new feature I actually really liked. But now that bosses get to attack like 10 times in a row and only have like a 2 second window for you to attack, it makes heavy weapons even shittier unless you're spamming a jumping heavy attack. And now katanas have all these busted weapon arts and shit. And bleed and frost damage were overpowered on launch and I think bleed is still pretty good from what I've heard. And it feels like everyone who says this game isn't that hard just looked up online the most broken build and just used that shit. That's not how you're supposed to play these fucking games. In Dark Souls 1 you could use any shitty weapon and beat the game no problem. Now in Elden Ring they're basically daring you to look up a build guide. That's fucking stupid. Even on launch, I abused the Mimic to beat the game because I just kind of got annoyed eventually at memorizing the various bosses' movesets. Could I have done it without the Mimic? I absolutely have no doubt. But I really don't care to prove it to anybody because this game sold like 25 million copies or whatever the fuck it is. A shit ton of people beating this game. It's not an accomplishment anymore. It's more of a gimmick of From Software's games to just dare you to beat it. How about you just make a fun game first? And again, Elden Ring is fun. I'm trying to focus on the positives, but everything I like about Elden Ring, I liked better about Dark Souls 1 or Bloodborne. That's the truth. And I specifically decided to compare Elden Ring's bosses to Demon Souls because Demon Souls actually had creative boss design. Were they easy? Yes. That doesn't mean they weren't fun or interesting though. They absolutely were much more interesting than pressing circle at the right time. And look, I think the open world was one of the better elements. Again, they're trying to make this distinct. 
I honestly still feel a bit conflicted about it. I think exploring an open world souls is interesting, but they really dropped the ball on the NPCs this time. You can't just keep doing what Demon Souls did a million more times. It just doesn't work for a giant open world. They actually should have had like a human settlement and proper quests or something. But actually going around and finding all these dungeons and fighting these various bosses is really cool for like the first 20 to 30 hours. It's just when you start fighting the same bosses over and over again, you fight the fucking double boss fights, which are all bullshit. Because unlike Ornstein and Smo, where the arena was literally designed around fighting two guys, in this game there wasn't really that sort of care put into it. Even the Godskin Apostle double fight, the arena is similar, but the Apostles can just attack straight through the fucking pillars with their stretchy arms. So honestly, to not rant about this for 20 minutes, I feel extremely conflicted by this game because I enjoyed the main gameplay mechanics, I enjoyed exploring the world mostly, I enjoyed the enemy variety mostly, other than the repeat bosses, I enjoyed the legacy dungeons, again mostly, except I feel like I've seen all of Miyazaki's tricks by now, I enjoyed over half of the bosses, but quite a few of them annoyed me for one reason or another. At the end of the day, I absolutely had fun with it. If I had no expectations for From Software games, then I wouldn't have nearly as much to complain about, though I likely would still complain about the difficulty, certainly. I just can't help but compare it to previous games. It's still absolutely the standout game for this year, and it's still one of the few open world games that feels like it actually benefits from having an open world and enhances the experience. It doesn't feel as well thought out as Breath of the Wilds, but still, in an era where all AAA games suck, Elden Ring easily stands above them and deserves Game of the Year 2022. So I guess the question is now, is this the worst year in gaming history? I don't think so. I think 2020 is probably the worst, and this year is about tied with last year. The only thing that's kind of depressing from this year is I learned personally through my own recent controversy and just fan backlash in general that people seem to deny that wokeness is getting worse in video games. And I think the only real consistency here is if somebody likes a game, they're going to pretend it's not woke, despite all of the same markers that would make something woke if it was a film or a TV show. And look, I understand that humans have a hard time being objective, especially about art. I mean, most art criticism is 100% subjective, even if it's based on facts. But for some reason, it is not acceptable to criticize wokeness in video games. There's entire communities built around criticizing wokeness in comic books and movies, but none for video games. I'm one of the very few people calling this shit out. I don't know why, maybe everyone sold out, maybe people just gave up on video games, maybe everyone in this community is brainwashed, I don't fucking know, but that in itself is deeply depressing to me. But I'm never gonna give up on this hobby, I've always loved it, it's always been more important to me than TV or movies. And look, even I get tired about talking about politics and video games. It's just impossible to avoid at this point. Almost every game has some kind of political agenda in it. And apparently normies are too blind to see it or just play dumb trying to gaslight us. And it fucking pisses me off, dude, okay? 2022 sucked. 2023 has the potential to be a good year. But as I've told you multiple times, do not get hyped. Do not fucking pre-order. I play these shitty games, so you don't have to. See you next time, guys.